Why would anyone even imagine multiplying vectors? This is a video for high school teachers of geometric algebra and of vector operations in general. Geometric algebra is, for lack of a better short description, a highly effective extension of vector algebra and calculus. Many GA proponents believe that GA can be taught effectively at the high school level. A LinkedIn group is in fact dedicated to that very purpose. You can find the link in the video description. Viewers who are interested in learning or teaching GA are, are quite welcome. This video is motivated by a, uh, an observation made by Professor Philippe Nen that in order for GA to become mainstream, we must convince high school teachers of its advantages for teaching basic topics of mathematics and science. In this video, we will not cover GA per se, but will instead deal with an issue that those teachers may encounter, namely the bewilderment of students at the thought of multiplying vectors. GA was invented by two 19th century mathematicians. Because they died soon afterward, GA never caught on. GA's rebirth in the 20th century owes a great deal to an observation made years ago by physicist David Hestinez, who is the one person most responsible for that rebirth. In his opinion, the mathematics of physics did not include a truly effective way to multiply vectors together. But upon hearing that brief history, history about Hestinez, students might reasonably ask, why would the idea of multiplying vectors occur to, to anyone in the first place? We've all heard similar questions from bewildered math students. One source of that bewilderment, and really it occurs with math students in general, is that we teachers can give the impression that mathematical operations had just been out there floating around in some inaccessible other dimension until those until they were revealed unto a few select people after which the rest of us mere mortals were supposed to figure out what those operations are and what to use them for students seem to learn better when teachers take pains to explain that the situation is almost completely the reverse that what we call mathematical operations were, nor were invented in order to solve certain real-world problems. If those, if those procedures ended up being useful enough, they were given names for convenient reference. And so anyway, that's where we get a lot of names for different mathematical operations. To help students understand why anyone would, would even imagine multiplying vectors, Let's examine two sorts of real-world problems that might have given rise to that idea. The first is the work performed by a force that acts in the same direction as the movement that it produces. We teach the students when they're young that we find the work by multiplying the force by the distance or this, the displacement. Later, when the students learn to express forces and displacements as vectors, we can do things that are more interesting. We can teach them how to calculate the work done by a force that does not act in the same direction as the movement that it produces. In this case, what we, what we do, really, is we find the projection of the force upon the direction of the displacement and we multiply the magnitude of that projection of the force by the magnitude of the displacement. And here we won't worry about signs or algebraic signs or other, well, other purposes different. But anyway, since this procedure that we've come up with here involves multiplications and vectors, for sake of convenience, why not give it a name like a certain multiplication of vectors? Of course, many of you know what or which multiplication of vectors this is, but we'll leave that aside. The point is that first came the procedure, and then someone had to come up with a name for it for convenience. The same thing will happen here in our next example. The torque produced by a force that acts perpendicular to a lever. To a lever. 
And as children, the students learn, well, the torque, you find that by multiplying the magnitude of the force by the length of the lever. And when, they, when the students learn about vectors, and they can, do, again, do things that are a little more complicated and interesting, like finding the torque produced by a force that is not perpendicular to the lever. In this case, we use another, the idea of a projection again. In this case, it's projection of the force upon a direction perpendicular to the lever. And the magnitude of the torque, and again, we won't get into things about the orientation of the torque or its um, algebraic sign, the magnitude of the torque, again, is found by a multiplication of, well, in this case, the magnitude of the perpendicular projection and the magnitude of the of L, which is, of course, the length of the lever. Again, here we have a case of a procedure that consists of a multiplication, and it involves vectors, so why not call it, again, some sort of vector product or vector multiplication for convenience? And again, many of you know precisely what sort of um, vector multiplication this is. Now, in geometric algebra, or one of geometric algebra's distinguishing features is what's called the geometric product. And among other things, it combines the two different vector products that we've just seen, which the one involving work and the one involving torque, in a simple, well-defined, and mathematically efficient way. But that's a subject for another time. I hope this video has been helpful. I hope it might um, help a few students become a little less bewildered. I look forward to your comments and hope again that, vector, that viewers will consider participating in the LinkedIn group that was mentioned earlier. Thank you for your time and attention.